We are producers, engineers, singers, songwriters, musicians, tour and live production crew, and, and thousands, thousands more of us. Without us, the music stops. We, we need, need your, your help to keep the music playing. Support those impacted today at musiccares.org. friends, Nick Cucci, Executive Director of the New York Chapter here, and welcome to the sixth and final episode of the Chapter Series Conversations. June is Black Music Month, and to celebrate, we've put together a timely discussion, a look back of sorts on the history of hip hop in New York City. Since the subject is so vast, this episode will have two parts. The first will be hip hop's golden age, basically from birth through the 90s, and then hip hop in the 21st century. For more than five decades, hip hop has evolved as an art form, maintaining its strong roots while simultaneously becoming the number one streamed genre of music today. Hip hop was born in the Bronx in the 1970s at a time when New York City was in shambles. There are plenty of documentaries and books that delve very deeply into this era, so I highly recommend you check them out. Early DJs and MCs would grab their gear and jack directly into a street lamp for electricity. Hip hop, its birthplace, its unique sound, its culture grew out of this. And while it is a Herculean task to cover all aspects of the genre's early years, we have assembled a few people who were there at the beginning and can shed some light through their firsthand experience. I want to thank you all for continuing to check out our conversation series and all of the chapter programming. Thanks as always to the New York Chapter Board for their support and the New York Chapter staff for producing this programming. My first hip hop memory is probably coming home after me and my brother first got our two turntables and a mixer and some vinyl records to spin like all the young people in New York City wanted to do. This was in 1979, maybe going into 80. And Rapper's Delight was already out. So Rapper's Delight was taking over everywhere. And everybody was like, yo, what's this new music? What is this rap thing? What is this hip hop thing? Oh, it's not singing. What the hell are they doing? They're not playing instruments. Why are they sampling Nile Rodgers and stealing Sheik's music? So there was all this enthusiasm and excitement about this new hip hop thing because Rapper's Delight put the hip hop on records. But my brother came home with this red label um, single because there was no albums. Everything was singles back then. And he had this red label record that said, it said enjoy on it. And the rapper's delight label was very attractive. It had a rainbow, it was light blue, it was beautiful. But this particular single was just red and plain and it said enjoy. And I know what it is. My brother put that on the put that vinyl on the turntable. He put the needle down on that. And this thing was different from Rapper's Delight. Because Rapper's Delight was kind of like a disco record. You know, they sampled good times at the baseline. Boom, boom, boom. But nobody. And the guy was like, hip, hop, the hip, the hip, the hip, hip. So we had mumble rap back then. So don't get it twisted. This new generation of mumble rappers, I can relate to y'all because we was mumbling too. But Rappers of Light came out and then my brother brought this red label record. When they put the needle on this record, it didn't go no hip hop, hip hop. This thing said, it was a party night. Everybody was breaking the highs, was screaming in the bass, was shaking and it won't be long to let everybody know when that flash is on the B-Box going. And then a voice said, Italian, Caucasian, Japanese, Spanish, Indian, Negro, Vietnamese, MC, disc jockeys, y'all, fly kids for the young ladies. Then five dudes introducing the crew, you got to see to believe. Each one took the number, one, two, three, four, five MCs. One guy said, I'm Melly Mel and I rock it so well. And then the second dude said, and I'm Mr. Ness because I rock the best. Then the third dude said, Raheem and all the ladies dream. And the fourth guy said, cowboy, and I make you jump for joy. 
And then the fifth dude said Creole. And then the other four dudes said Solid Gold. Kid Creole playing the role. Blew my mind. Right then and there, I ran through the house. Give me a pen and paper. Give me some pen and paper. I got to do that. So that was my first hip hop memory. It changed my very DNA essence in being. Man, I'm so excited to be celebrating Black Music Month. Um, as the vice president of the New York chapter, you know, when you talk music and you talk New York City, I think it's kind of synonymous with hip hop, although there were plenty of other genres um, that came through New York City. Hip hop in New York City are synonymous because it's the birthplace of hip hop, this amazing genre of music that's been able to take care of so many of us, to give us outlets to create, to provide, to inspire and so many other things. And um, it's always great when I get a chance to have a conversation with talent that I'm tapped in with um, because I love what they're doing, because I love what they stand for, because I genuinely just rock with the music, you know? Um, and that's what I have with me today. I don't know where to start. Should I go ladies first or should I save the best for last? I don't know. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go with Young Devin. Um, shout out to Young Devin, Brooklyn's own Young Devin. Now you've probably seen her or seen a lot of your favorite people talking about her. I don't necessarily like the word cosign, but if there's um, people that you respect and whose opinion you respect, they've seen Devin, they posted Devin, they talked about her, um, making a whole lot of noise in the city. And she's from the borough, Brooklyn. Yeah, you know I mean, shout out to young Devin. What's going on with it? What's up? How you feeling? Feeling great. Um, as someone who's no stranger to my show, um, no stranger to the audience, no stranger to a lot of you, because so many people follow the brand that is Dreamville, the brand that is Fiends, um, from gold and platinum records to performances all around the world, you know, tearing down stages, tearing down ciphers, doing so many incredible things. My guy, Boss, is here. What's up, Boss? Come on, brother. How you feel? Great, great, great. Representing Q York, you know what I mean? Queens. Oh, we got Queens and Brooklyn in here. It's a little BQE thing going on. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, a little BQE vibes. Um, and like I said in the intro, being that New York City is the home of hip hop, the birthplace of hip hop. I wanted to start right there. I wanted to start with inspiration, um, how you guys got into the music, you know, not necessarily the people that inspired you just yet, but what are some of the things that made you choose this crazy life as, as your profession, as your calling? Um, Devin, I'll start with you. What, what got you into the music? Uh, when I started doing music when I was seven, my family's from Trinidad. So we have the genre of music called soca, you know, it hones in from the Caribbean. And it's a really big genre when it comes to, you know, the Caribbean aspect. And uh, I did like a talent show. My school had a heritage day and you had to do a song from your culture. And so, of course, I did a song from Trinidad, and the soca song. The performance went super well. And then we went. Uh, my mom, she has a friend who's a radio host. He put me on the radio. I sang one song on the radio and I started getting booked for shows immediately. And then I started touring and traveling you know, for like a year straight with no song, just off the strength of I was the only child in soca music. So it was like a never before seen thing. And um, yeah, I went like a year of touring and then I finally released my first single when I was like eight. Uh, and that was like the biggest song. Like if you were like a kid in the Caribbean at the time, that was kind of like the biggest song for all of the kids. And I started performing in like Trinidad, uh, like with Masha Montano, like selling out shows in stadiums, like 30,000 people and, you know, selling out my own shows overseas. And I always just felt like soca music wasn't as mainstream and I wanted to be the artist to bridge that gap. So whether it be hip hop, R&B, pop, I always said that I would transcend into a more mainstream genre to take over the culture because, you know, it's still a part of me being from Brooklyn and just introduce the world to such an amazing culture. And that's exactly what I'm doing and the steps that I'm taking. It's crazy. I wonder how much of that soca background and caribbean background plays into your flow the way you deal with pockets i remember watching the biggie mm -hmm. documentary the latest biggie documentary not too long right. ago and, and it was um, talking about his jamaican roots right his jamaican roots and the jazz influence and how he was almost scatting on the track how do you mm -hmm. feel that that's been able to benefit you you know throughout your recording and yeah literally like this crazy it comes to like flows and my cadence and everything like just the way that I write songs I still format my songs the same way I would write a soca song like when it comes to melodies a lot of my melodies and a lot of the things that I hear the reason why it sounds so unique to like maybe the more urban genres because it's Caribbean sounds 
you know, or just the way that I say certain things or flow in certain songs or my twang, I might throw it in and to say a word and it might sound a little different and give you a little oomph. That's all from that Trinidad flavor, that Trinidadian feel and I infuse it into my songs. And then I have songs where I'm straight singing in like a trini accent like i'm fully on caribbean beat so i definitely try to infuse it to as much as possible but yeah trinidad and the caribbean roots definitely play a big role into just my whole aura when it comes to me as an mc absolutely and i think that's part of what makes you unique Baz, you are very unique as well from your background your birthplace your heritage where your parents are from you know please explore it all with our with our audience yeah my, my family's from sudan um so i spent a lot of time throughout my childhood, just traveling a lot of the African continent. You know, I got four older siblings, so they're always putting me on the world music, but it was everything, you know, it was everything from like African music to like Mob Deep and Nas on the other hand, you know, so it was just kind of taking it all in, um, growing up with all those influences. And then really I started DJing with my older brother, DJ MoMA. Um, he gave me like a laptop to start opening up his gigs. And now it's the same laptop. I would go after gigs. And, and I remember one night I was just with the homies and we pulled up GarageBand and they were like, yo, let's do a freestyle. And I was like, you know, like, man, I don't, I don't rap, bro. Like everybody rapping, I don't rap. Uh, and then like, you know, I did it. And then I found that I never really had a form of, of artistic expression my whole life up until that point. And it's like, it's really incredibly addictive to find that, you know, find a way to express yourself, you know, whether it's paint, you know, poetry, or for me, it was, it was music and songwriting. Um, and from there, it was just something where I, I really want to hone in on the craft and just get better every day. Absolutely. Now, when we talk about the city, New York City, um, as we celebrate in Black Music Month, and like I said, there's so much music and, and culture that comes from within these five boroughs. What are some of the art, who are some of the artists, or what are some of the things that inspired you locally, you know, from just your, your, your parts of the, of the, the city, or artists that may have inspired you or just people that you pick from or learn from? Who are some of those people? You know what, man? I think there was an era of mixtapes like back in the early 2000s when it was like G and like 50 Cent is the future, like Crazy. No Mercy, No Fear, all the D-Block mixtapes. And I think it wasn't just about the music, even though the music was amazing. I just vividly remember like all of us riding a bus, you know, to get to, to Jamaica Ave, to the terminal, you know, to see like what's the new mixtape that they got at all the mixtape spots, like bouncing around all the mixtape spots, trying to just pick up new music, find new gems. Um, I think those were like very formative years for us, for sure. Absolutely. And what about you, Devin? Uh, yeah, I definitely was inspired by New York when it came to hip hop. This is the home of hip hop. Like when I first fell in love with hip hop, it, I was watching a, a Nicki Minaj documentary called My Time Again. And just mm -hmm. seeing how hard she was working and things like that is what first really kind of made me pay attention to hip hop. Because then I started listening to albums differently. Like that was the first time I caught a punchline in the metaphor. That was at like 14. So then I started getting into artists like Meek. I started getting into artists even like Jay-Z. DMX, Jada Kiss, and I fell in love with Lauren Hill because she kind of made me feel comfortable with telling my story and putting melodies and raps together because, you know, coming off of doing soca music, I always just felt like, okay, I'm going to keep the rapping and soca thing separate from each other. But hearing Lauren Hill and, you know, hearing that she sang just as well as she rapped, it kind of made me realize that it's possible to do both and blend the two. So I just started mixing up all these different artists and even out of New York, just from different places in general and just figuring it out and putting it together. For sure. You spoke about two really um, iconic names in, in, in music. When you speak of women, you speak of Nicki Minaj and what she's been able to do, you know, in mm -hmm. the rap space. Um, you speak of Lauryn Hill and what mm -hmm. she's been able to do in the music space. How important do you think it is to have like that type of female representation for a young woman like yourself coming up in the game? Yeah, I mean, that was that was super important to me. Like, I think that was probably one of the most important things because it sparked me to want to even rap. Like, that was super important. I love Nikki and I just love the bars, the punchlines. That's the most when you want to be the best, you got to really look at the best. And as any, as much as anybody can say anything, that's still the highest on the female rap artist of all time. One of the, like when, her, when it's all said and done, like her name is going to be in like music history. Lauren Hill is going to be in music history. And these are women in male dominated genres that, are, that took over and made strides and are still making strides to this day and just are living legends. So you always got to tip your hat off to those kind of people. For sure. And I mean, 
again, they've been inspiring for so long, so many artists to come. And now you in the public eye, both of you in the public eye are inspiring the next generation. Vaz, you got all the fiends. You got all the fiends out there, Vaz. Um, when you look at your audience, your fan base, the supporters, the people that love your music, the people that buy the merch, that come out to the shows um, internationally, domestically, just talk to me about that feeling um, for somebody who was like, man, I don't know if I should be rapping. I don't know if I'm rap in garage band to selling out shows to having multi-platinum success and releases. What's that like? I think the best part about it is, you know, really building community, finding like these like-minded people all across the world that, you know, subscribe to your thoughts or, or the things you're expressing, what you're sharing with them and they relate. And, and then in turn, you know, they're putting on other people and, and, and growing your support base or, you know, you know, I get stories of people like, yo, I was online for the club and, and somebody saw my shirt and was like, oh, like you rock with the fiends and they pulled me in like with them. And like, it's just little stories like that, that I get a kick out of just to see that, you know, if, if I put out good energy in my music, that then my supporters will take that and, and kind of spread that all over. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about New York City, right? Because obviously New York hip hop started here. Um, birth here, went crazy, went international, went national, went worldwide, um, and then the West, and then the South, and then various parts of the country. Um, but now it feels like the conversation um, where it hadn't been in New York for a really long time is back in New York with so many artists popping off from New York at the moment. Um, talk to me about that the pressure, the stigma, or anything that comes along with maybe preconceived notions about being a New York artist? Uh, I don't really feel like it's a lot of pressure when it comes to being a New York artist, if you know what you're doing. Like, you know, if you a spiller, you're gonna do what you gotta do and you're gonna step up to the plate when it's time, you know? So I, you know, speaking for myself, I've definitely always pushed my pen and I've always focused on my writing skills. And I grew up, and not, you know, necessarily even grew up listening to, even though I did, but I more so studied that golden era of hip hop. And it was just like real spitters when it was, I watched a video of Jada Kiss just being at the radio show and just blazing it down. Freestyle. It's still on YouTube. Right. It's just like those types of things I would watch over and over again to the point where it started being like muscle memory for me, you know, to the mm. point where I would look at a word and try to see how I could turn it into a metaphor, you know? It's just rapping is like a sport. And so I feel like when you push that pen, no matter where you're from, it's gonna work. So I don't ever really try to even think of like, you know, oh my gosh, I'm from New York. It's a lot of pressure. I actually use that as one of the biggest things for me to keep going. You know, it's just like I'm from New York, so I'm going to represent and make sure that I show my culture and who I am, my city, and where I'm from. For sure. Do you feel like people think you should sound a certain way? Um, I don't think people think we should sound a certain way, but I do think that people expect like a certain you know, type of sound from New York artists at first. Like they might expect you to be like a little aggressive or a spitter, but it's so many ranges of artists nowadays. Like you got people from Pop Smoke to A Boogie to Jay to like, it's it's been so much different ranges and phases of like hip hop in New York that, you know, it's really hard to try to, cat, you know, categorize somebody from the city, which is a thing that I really do love because it goes to show you that it's really a boiling pot of different things that we all could represent in different lanes. Absolutely. Boss, what do you think? I agree, honestly, completely with what Devin said, because when you look at it as an artist, you just have to tell your story authentically, first and foremost. You know, and I think being from New York, that's just like a badge of honor. That's a matter of pride. Like we want to put mm -hmm. on because of the great lineage of our city, you know, of our boroughs. We want to be part of that conversation. But I think at the end of the day, it's never really had an effect on the type of music I make. I'm just going to make what I'm inspired to make and tell my truth and, and really just express myself honestly. And then, you know, where I'm from is where I'm from. Like nobody could take that from you. Absolutely. Um, I got a chance to speak to some iconic hip hop creators, um, pioneers, you know, from all walks of the business. And I wanted to draw the parallel from where it started to where it's at right now. Um, and there's so many ways to connect those dots, but I want to hear from both of you, what it's like to be an artist modern day, 21st century, with technology, um, with social media, with direct to consumer, with all of these different platforms and options at your fingertips. What is it like to be an artist in modern day? Uh, well, I feel like, you know, for my generation, to be an artist modern day, 
you got to be more than an artist. Like talent in the music is really, really like 10% of selling yourself as an artist. And of course, it's always been like that. But, you know, before social media, and I was just discussing this, like even the little things like how people react to celebrities are so different now. Like before people used to see celebrities, they'll pass out, they'll faint, they'll chase your car. There'll be so many people running. Now you see a celebrity walking on the street, they're like, oh, that's so-and-so because social media has made people feel so available and used to you. So as an artist, it's like, you gotta be an artist. You gotta be, you know, your own marketer. You gotta, you know, be your own publicist. You gotta do everything because you gotta figure out your algorithm. You gotta figure out what your fans like versus don't like. You gotta figure out, types of things to share on the internet versus what not to share on the internet. You got to figure out, okay, I put this energy out on the internet. This is the type of energy I'm going to receive. Like, it's not just say something in a song and then, you know, people talk about it, but there's no social media. Everybody has social media now. Everybody has a room full of opinions and a room full of judgment. And so as an artist, I do say it's more pressure in that sense on the social media end because it's so much more and you get to receive and see literally everything. And, you know, you got to make yourself available. Selling yourself nowadays is kind of like one of the biggest things, like your personality, who you are. But as long as you stay true and authentic, it's only but so much the pressure on social media could really cave in. I feel that. Yeah. I mean, Devin, you're wise beyond your years, for real. Like, <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I feel you 100%. It really is 24-7 now, you know, but I think, um, I guess on, on the bright side of things, it, it's, it's made it a lot easier to find your fan base. I think it's made careers for a lot of artists that, you know, prior may not have gotten a chance or may not have gotten a look or, or the opportunity to even find their fans because now it doesn't necessarily take um, all this money to, to market you when, you know, in, in your really in your fingertips, you can go ahead and, and mm -hmm. put all this content out to the world and see who comes back and who it resonates with. So, you know, there's definitely, there's pros and cons to it, but I think overall it's gonna allow more artists to keep making careers for themselves. Right. I can imagine like if Nas put Elmatic out on Twitter and people would, yeah, it's too short. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> everybody would have an opinion, classic or not. You know what I'm saying? Like always, people would always have something to say. How do you deal with those conversations, you know, whether it be a positive um, something or a negative something in that social media space? Because, you know, for as much as people can praise you behind the keyboard, people also find um, refuge behind the keyboard and protection. And so they can also say a bunch of crazy shit. Um, how have you been able to figure it out, deal with it? You got to look at all the greats, all your favorites. I think really, if there's no conversation, that's the bad part, you know? I think you can't really hone in on people saying negative things as much as you can't really hone in on people saying positive things. You kind of have to keep even keel throughout the whole situation and look at, you could search anybody's name, whether it's the top, you know, you could look at Kendrick, Cole, Drake, there's people hating on them. You know what I mean? Um, there's people hating on everybody out there. Like it's, it's almost a thing on the internet to just do for fun. I don't even think people mean half the things they say, you know, so I don't, I don't take it at face value. It's just like, if the conversation is being made around you, then you're doing something good. For sure. Definitely with yeah. you being, you know, yeah, you being even newer in the game and, and coming, you know, right from that space of people seeing you, you know, you blowing up and, and a lot of it being attributed to social media. How do you do? Yeah. Uh yeah, I definitely always just try to say cut through the noise. Like it's gonna be people, it's gonna be hate, you know, where there's good, there's bad, where there's bad, there's good. There's always gonna be hate. Even if you feel like you're super talented and you're super lyrical, you know, you just make great records. There's still always gonna be somebody who doesn't like your music, but that's what the internet is for. I feel like the internet definitely helps you find a fan base for everybody. There's an artist for everyone. There's a personality for everybody. And so I definitely do think once you just cut through the noise and try not to take the internet too serious, like, you know, I feel like a the internet for artists should be like a tool to just connect to your fans, see what your fans are thinking, how they feel about your artistry and your work and keep it pushing, you know, trying to get into debates and arguing and all of that stuff. That's getting caught up in the noise. But once you cut through that, the internet is not as serious as people try to make it seem to be, you know, you got to just understand, yeah, this is a business and the internet is what I use to help my business, but this is not something that I'm going to go to sleep about and think, you know, like I'm not going to sit down and think about shade room team comments while I'm laying down in bed, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Not shade room team. Um, as we celebrate Black Music Month, um, I want to ask two parts of that. First of all, what is Black music to you, Boss? What is Black music to you? Oh man, it's it's our story. You know, it's through carry through generations. I think 
for us, especially when you look at, you know, all the, all the oppression we faced and ways that we've risen above it, I think you see music is at the center of that a lot of times. And one of our biggest exports to the world as, as black people is culture and music. So I think it's really, you know, it, it just goes hand in hand with our story. It's kind of, it is, it is our platform. No doubt. Yeah, I definitely agree. That was perfectly said. Like hip hop is definitely just our culture. It's definitely what's gotten us through years and years of oppression. Even when you think about things back before, slave masters never even used to want slaves to congregate and create music and things like that. These are the types of things that was keeping us through it. Even when you look at sad times, we got music for darker times. You have music for happier times. And even when you just listen to things that I hear on the radio that got nothing to do with us, you could hear the inspiration, even in little things like the beats, the drums, all of these things come all the way even back to Africa. So I feel like we play a major role. And I think that it's an amazing you know, way in a month to celebrate Black music. And I just think that it pushes the culture forward even more. Absolutely. And I'm glad you ended there. Why celebrate Black Music Month? Why is it important? Uh, it's definitely important. Like I said, it tells our story. If you look at any genre, you know, when it comes to Black music, it all is based off of telling a story, you know, like hip hop. It was based off of us, you know, going through things in our neighborhoods and our lives mentally that, you know, at the time, especially in black communities, therapy is not something that's pushed. So, you know, people was rapping, they were making poetry, turning it into rhymes, speaking on systematic oppression and things that they was facing, whether it be like the drug era when everybody was just going through such hard times, whether you was a fiend or you was a dealer, you know, but everybody had different perspectives and they was talking about it. And it kind of just told the story about where we came from, how far we came and I love the fact that, you know, it's artists, they talk about like sh the struggle, but then it's, you know, there's still that space and area where they talk about the diamonds and the cars and the clothes because it represents how far we came, you know? A lot of the sure. time people try to say it's too like ignorant, but I definitely do think like it just shows that rags to riches story. And I feel like we started off ri with riches anyways, you know? So I that just part. love it and I love what it represents. No doubt. Boz, why do you think it's important to celebrate Black Music, Black Music Month? Well, yeah, I mean, to, to touch on what Devin was saying, it really is our history. You know, if you look at, you know, the Sam Cooks, the Nina Simones, the Bob Marleys, the, you know, up to Tupac and, and, and you know, you could say Kendrick and Cole, the current guys kind of carrying those torches as far as uh, when it comes to just being socially conscious and, and it's a little capsule of time, you know, like I could, I could listen to Sam Cooke and hear the pain in his voice and in the stories he's telling or Nina Simone and, and picture what it was like you know, for our forefathers and our ancestors growing up through the times they were growing up in, you know, and and I and and hopefully, you know, kids in the future will be able to listen to us and, and be like, okay, that's what they were into. That's what they were doing. And, you know, for people that haven't really been able to tell our history the right way, I feel like this is like the perfect medium. It's been authentic and it's going to live forever. Absolutely. I mean, like you both said, the music, last it shines through it's gotten us through years and years and generations and generations whether it just be the beat of the drum whether it just just be the chant whether it be you know fifty thousand sold out arenas um mm -hmm. the music in all different pockets and places and spaces has has gotten us through so much and gotten us to so much um uh, before we close out i do want to talk because you guys both spoke about like the history and, and where you are right now let's talk about the future um, Lord willing, legacy. What do you? What do you? Do you think about it? What sh do you want your legacy to be? Um, when you, when it's all said and done, what do you want people to remember you for? Um, when they speak your name, what type of things are you trying to hear, or would you like to hear said about you? Uh, well, for me, I, I always just tell people I just want to be remembered. You know, like when it's all said and done, I don't even want to be remembered for one like the greatest rappers of all time like I want to be in just the music conversation in general like it's certain artists like when you look at an artist like Drake Drake the biggest artist in hip-hop but he's transcended beyond that in a sense of just like a music conversation whether people like it or not it's those types of conversations that I see myself being in and I want to be in because it's not just one genre you know that I 
try to do. You know, I just do whatever I'm inspired by. If I want to go in the studio and make an R&B song today, that's what I do. If I want to go in and make like a drill song, that's what I'll do. If I go in and I make a soca song, that's what I'll do. But it's all music and it all tells my story and it's all true to me, you know? So at the end of the day, I just want to inspire people across the world. You know, I definitely always preach about generational wealth. You know, I feel like I'm kind of like the first person in my family to be on this type of level. And I want to change the whole you know, the whole route of where we were supposed to even go. Like, let's say we had generational curses. I want to be that one to break the curse. And, you know, my last name, be able to ring name, you know, ring bells for my kids two, three generations down the line beyond me, you know? Like, I'm not even going to really see the fruits of all my labor. I'm not going to see, you know, where soca music is going to be 50, 60, 80, 90, 100 years from now. But, you know, it's, you know, I'm grateful and I'm thankful that I'm putting in that hard work now so that it'll be able to happen. So just to be remembered and be in the conversation of music and just to show that I brought something different to the culture is what, you know, I want. Amen to that, for real. <laughs> it's hard to add more to that, but I would say, like, you know, like really like she was saying, is, is, is being remembered for staying outside the box, you know, pushing out of my comfort zone. Like she said, she can go do a soca track, you know, go do a drill track, go do an R&B track. Um, in a lot of ways, I, I feel the same is that, you know, mm -hmm. you just pushing yourself to try new things and keep pushing yourself to just grow out of your comfort zone. And if people respond to that and remember you for that, I think, you know, that's a, that's a hell of a compliment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you touched on um, the generational wealth. You know, so many of us, because of this amazing music and this amazing culture that we contribute so much to are first generation rich, you know, to, to right. quote my brother Sky Zoo, right? We the first ones through our lineage that's had an opportunity to take care of generations and generations to come. And with that, you know, of course, with, with the success comes responsibility, um, but it's an opportunity to change the entire narrative of where we are, who we are, how our family is perceived, you know, Dame said hustle for your last name and all of those things, all of those things mean so much to us. And it's just amazing that music has been the platform and a catalyst to, to take us to so many incredible places and spaces. I want to thank you both for your time today. Um, not only the art that you've made and, and, and inspired people with, but for the, the words that you spoke today, because you know, for as dope as it sounds in two minutes on the beat, um, when you really get a chance to break it down in conversations like this, I think people receive it even more. So I hope that you guys gain some new fans and supporters and listeners. Um, and I hope that the people that love the music got a chance to find a deeper connection with you all today. Thank you for helping me and the New York Academy, <laughs> the New York uh, chapter of the Recording Academy um, celebrate Black Music Month. Let us know, you know, I don't normally do this, but let the people know where to find you, social media and all of that, Devin, let the people know where you at. Yeah, uh, well, first and foremost, like I said, I want to say thank you to you guys as well for just having me on this platform, giving me the opportunity. Shout out to Boz, another dope artist that I'm super blessed to just be sitting here next to, you know, talking to. So thank you guys so much. You guys can follow me on all social medias and streaming platforms at Young Devin, Y-O-U-N-G-D-E-V-Y-N. I'm following you, Devin. I'm about to- I'm Yeah, gonna, most definitely. I'm highly impressed by you, for real. Like, Thank you. You have a great mind on you, for real. Thank right. you, I appreciate it. I wish you all the best. And thank, thank you, you guys for having me. You know, it's, it's for New York, it's for Recording Academy. It's exciting times to be here. I'm Bosch, it's BAS on all social media platforms. And, you know, see you guys soon. No doubt. Well, we're looking forward to new music from both of you. Um, and again, on behalf of the New York chapter and the whole entire Recording Academy, thank you for your time today. The work that you put in and just, you know, that life that you spoke into the conversation has been amazing. I'm up out of here. Thank y'all for pulling up and tapping in. You know how we do it, man. Black Music Month, New York chapter. Respect the vibes. My first hip hop memory is growing up in Los Angeles, a defining moment that really made me a fan for life was discovering NWA, um, which I did in junior high school. Um, and that music was so poignant and really reflected the, the city that I was living in, the city that I grew up in, in a way that no other music that I had ever heard did. Um, it felt reflective of the, the moment and um, from then on, I've been a fan for life. Um, and that that first NWA record really um, put in motion a career love and lifetime passion for hip hop.
Man, I am so excited to be a part of this conversation today, presented by the New York chapter. You know, me being the VP of the New York chapter, me being a, a hip hop lover, me being a music connoisseur, a student, uh, and sometimes educated in this game, this just brings me so much joy to be able to get this panel of people together with this wealth of knowledge and information and history as we celebrate hip hop throughout, you know, the New York chapter. Um, I wanted to have a conversation today about the golden age, the golden era, the start of hip hop. Um, I just wanna run through just the, the amazing panelists that I have with me today. My good friend, Faith Newman is here. She is, correct me if I'm wrong, Faith, the senior VP of a and Reservoir right now, right? Executive Vice President. Exa oh, come on now, wait a minute, boss up. Boss we, up, got, we, got, we got a promotion, we got a promotion. So joining the conversation is legendary Hank Shockley, um, producer, educator, extraordinaire, legendary bomb squad. I mean, the list goes on and on. I could spend the whole hour just running down the resume of everybody here. Hank, how are you, brother? I'm good, man. Thank you for having me, you know, and, and hopefully we can add something uh, of educational value to people out there. <laughs> Listen, all you got to do is say your name and people become instantly enlightened and, and educated. That's all you got to do is show up, Hank. So thank you for being here. Um, well, that's you know, okay. God bless and good night. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping it uh, legendary. Listen, if it wasn't for the Bronx, you know the vibes, man. You know the rest of that. Um, I don't even know where to begin, but basically at the beginning, Grandmaster Flash was there. Hip hop historian, educator, DJ, innovator, um, just an all around great guy. And thank you first and foremost for not only being here today, but being the reason that the rest of us are here today as well, man. Thank How you. are you? Um, thank you very much. I appreciate it. You know, um, all I can say is in 72, doing the things that I did is just an absolute blessing to be one of the people that seen this thing manifest and flourish to one of the biggest musical things on the planet. You know, it's, it's wonderful because sometimes when you are an innovator or an inventor, you can, you could put something on a table and, and the world will say, ill, you know, for us, it was like, Oh, what is this? Right. You know, and just that, that there, just that little bit of, Oh, what is this? You know, kind of propelled this thing to, take it to where it is. So it's, it's actually a blessing to, to, to even be on this conversation. Thank you. No, nah, absolutely. And we're blessed to have you here. And I definitely want to talk about that, you know, because when you are at the beginning or the forefront of something, although you might understand that it's something magnetic and powerful, the foresight to see where hip hop is today, I definitely want to touch on that. Um, and Rocky, I wanted to go to you last because I feel like what you're doing with the Universal Hip Hop Museum is really bringing all of these like-minded people together um, and really shining this light on hip hop and the culture and the, the artifacts and the participants of it. Um, Rocky Buchano is here. And, and just, just briefly, let us know, you know, as I know that it's still um, being put together and developed, but let us know what the Universal Hip Hop Museum is. We call ourselves the official record of hip hop. Our mission is to document, preserve, and celebrate hip hop history on a global level, starting with it began with my boy Flash, who, I, who I've known from the very beginning, all the way to where we are today. So, you know, we want to make sure that everyone's story is properly documented celebrated and presented to the world in the most authentic you know, way with the most highest level of integrity. And, and that's what we work on, you know, working with educators and historians and, and scholars to make sure that those stories are not only you know, uh, preserved, but when we, you know, when we showcase it to the world, make sure that everyone is represented the way they, they want to be represented. I mean, you talk about day one, if you could go back a day before day one, Flash, you were there, man. Talk to me about, you know, your, your beginning and your start in this hip hop. Before it was a culture or a billion dollar business, it was something that you guys just started to create and, and, and um, bring to reality. 
as a, as a very young boy, I used to watch my dad come home. He worked for the Long Island Railroad, the track, big track repairman. And dad would come home, have his spirits, and the mom would cook dinner. But then dad would go into this closet. And inside this closet were all these square things. And these, these, these square things had artwork on it. It could have been a car, a picture, a human being, a flower, whatever. And I was wondering what was dad going to do with that? So dad pulled out these, this black disc and I'm watching him take this black disc and put it in this brown box. And when he put it inside this brown box, he turned something on and sound came out of this brown box. So my mother was a seamstress. So what I did was I stole a needle from a little plastic case. I turned the table on, the, 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 the stereo on, and I took the needle and I put it on the record and I felt vibrations. And I said to myself, oh, so this is where the music lived. The music lived in the black tunnels. This was my own definition on how I see it. So from that point on, that was like the total, total mission for me to figure out how this works. And then after a while, I was taking apart anything in the house, the hairdryer, the wash machine. Like I just became public enemy, enemy number one because I was trying to understand how do these things happen the way that they happen. Then I started to get up in the middle of the night and, and watch my, mo my mother's house parties. And I noticed that the part where the drummer was playing alone, the bodies were gyrating more. And I think from that point on, as I became a young teenager, that was the part that I really wanted to hone in on. When you hear that story and you start to think about, you know, what you were able to do with, you know, the, the seamless bed of music, but then you taking two and three and four different records and putting those together and, and making that, like you were like a maestro, you know, like putting together a, a symphony, a composition of your own. Um, talk to me about your start and, and the way you were able to discover and start to create music. Oh, my start is pretty similar to Flash. I just wanna, I just wanna give Flash a little acknowledgement because I'm gonna start off with my, with my hip hop venture. When I started, I was following uh, Flash from, and Flash taught me a lot about, from his marketing, he taught me a lot about marketing. And, and one of the flyers that, that me and Chuck used to, like, we used to, we used to, like, we used to like wait for Flash to come to Queens <laughs> because we couldn't get to the Bronx. <laughs> so so when, when we saw a flyer with Flash, coming out of the city, he had, the, he had, he had Flash, the, 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 the Marvel comic character, with records in his hand, jetting out of the city. And he was playing in Queens. And I was like, you know what? This guy is the one that's on to something. And that's when I knew like, that, that, that his, his concept was far superior than everybody else's in terms of marketing. And, and the fact that his name was Grandmaster Flash. And, I, and I'm a comic book, I'm a comic book fan. So, so I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is this guy's amazing. And so I but the but the one thing about it is that when I listened to a lot of the, the, the records that was coming out of the Bronx, that was coming out of Harlem, you know, and, and I've noticed that they use bands to make their backbeats and, and, and to make, you know, and, and to make their instrumentation. And I and I was saying to myself, was like, well, you know. You know, they play records at the live show and they rock on the records. Why aren't, why isn't that concept being done on the record itself? So that's when I decided to explore that, that, that dynamic is be able to take, take records to make other records, which was, which was, everybody else was going to studios and have musicians go in there and they'll have a drum beat going on, maybe a, maybe a, maybe a drum machine playing and then I'll have a bass line and they'll have a keyboards on that and stuff. And I was like, nah, I want to take records to make other records. So, so with that, you know, kind of like born the kind of like bomb squad public enemy, you know, sound.
I mean, and, and what an amazing sound it is. It, it's definitely like the soundtrack to my upbringing. Um, but before I was here, so many of you were already creating and, and manifesting this thing. Rocky, as your time as a DJ, as a promoter in the clubs, running those streets, when you heard hip hop, you know, just give me some of your earliest and fondest memories. So, um, no, I, I used to run around New York City with my cousin, uh, Pete DJ Jones, and I was a DJ at the Stardust Ballroom up in the Bronx. And, uh, you know, uh, similar to, you know, everyone else's stories, I used to play when I wasn't playing in, in, in the clubs. You know, I lived in the Valley, so we have a big park called Hayfin Park up in the Valley. And I used to play outdoors uh, in, in the Valley Park. But uh, w one of my favorites, favorite memories was actually when we brought Flash to the Stardust. And he was playing on Pete's set. And, you know, it was Pete, myself, and I forget who the other DJ was. It was like three DJs, but Flash was like the guest DJ. And this was pretty much the first time that a lot of people from Uptown got a chance to see Flash. Experience besides Flash was, you know, going to a cool Herc party. My, my boys and I went to his party and, you know, it was cool hearing cool Herc, but the thing that was most exciting was the B-Boys because I had never seen that, you know what I'm saying? So watching B-Boys do their thing was really what inspired me to stick with the music side, of, you know, uh, my passion. And then, you know, uh, you know, when I was DJing, you know, a lot of the hip hop guys were not coming down into the city where, where my cousin was DJing. They were mostly staying up uptown. Uh, there was only one, one other guy, DJ Hollywood, who would travel back and forth at that time. And, you know, he he was a one man show. You know, he used to rap on the mic and play the music and, you know, do it all. You know, so whereas Flash would have his MCs and I had MCs as well. Hollywood was a one man band like Starsky, almost similar to Lovebuck Starsky. Those guys could rap and DJ at the same time. So th those are my earliest, you know, memories of, of hip hop. But Flash is at the top of the list uh, because, you know, when, when I sit, when I saw him before he even, at that time, he didn't even bring bring his MCs with him that night. It was just him on the turntables. So you know, it, it was very exciting to see that. Flash is a real life superhero that we got right here. Faith, I have to assume that your story is somewhat different. You know, as we look yeah. at the panel, as we look at everybody and hear everybody's. Uh, origin, the beginning. Yeah. How does yours? How does yours vary? Um, well, I grew up in Philly, so you know my experience in the early days of hip hop is a little different because it took a little longer for things to migrate from New York to Philadelphia. So that you know, um, the first rap record I ever heard uh, when I was thirteen and I was roller skating um, at United Skates of America in Philadelphia was Rapper's Delight. So that was my first entree into hip hop. And I remember very clearly um, when that record came on, literally stopping in my tracks and, you know, just completely mind blown, never heard anything like it, became completely obsessed, found a friend who lived in New Jersey who was able to get some like bootleg cassettes from New York Spoonie G and Sequence and Funky Four Plus One and Treacherous Three and all this stuff. So I, you know, I immersed myself in it as much as I possibly could until I got old enough to sneak away to New York when I was 16, which is what I used to do so that I could go to the Roxy um, and um, tell my parents that I was staying at a friend's house, got on the Greyhound bus, went to New York, went to the Roxy. First night I went to the Roxy, I had, it was just mind blown. Um, Planet Patrol was performing. I know Bambata was there. Melly Mel and Scorpio were like walking around in the crowd. Rocksteady was there. Um, people were doing graffiti on the plexiglass. It was like um, heaven for me, just heaven. No, that's, that's amazing. Uh, hip hop was, was born right out of that necessity to be heard, to create. You know, um, so many things in Black culture were born out of that necessity where we didn't have an outlet or didn't have options, and so we were yes, able sir. to create these things. And and um, unfortunately, we haven't benefited the most 
from the creations of the culture. But, you know, again, the, the opportunity that we have now to make sure that we give flowers, to make sure that Grandmaster Flash and the Curious Five are Lifetime Achievement Award recipients from the Recording Academy, to make sure that the Universal Hip Hop Museum gets off the ground and, and, and makes amazing things happen is what we're here for. Hank, one of my favorite groups. I mean, coming up in the 90s, Public Enemy was everything. It was everything. It was the sound. It was it was a perfect place in hip hop because, I mean, the music was incredible. Chuck's voice was incredible. Flavor's energy was amazing. Um, and even though it was very much entertaining, it was also very educational. Um, there was there was Black Pride. There was activism. There was conscious thoughts and, 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 and movements being spoken about. Um, talk to me about just those times of, of creating that amazing, amazing music along with your brother and Chuck and, and Flav and, and Terminator X and Professor Griffin, the whole P squad. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because first of all, I, I just want to say uh, to, to Rocky, man, I, I didn't know that you was a cousin of Pete DJ Jones because I'm, I'm a crazy fan, him and Becky DJ Jones, Moya. Uh, Grandmaster Flowers <laughs> and and the bunch. So I grew up, you know, following following them cats like like crazy. So I'm I'm older. I'm pretty much older than everybody. So but my my experience with hip hop came later. So I kind of saw what was going on with the culture because at at the time, you know, there was times when when I would be in Jamaica and 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 Jamaica they had the the uh, the little you know the little flea markets there. And the flea markets was, was there, was printing uh, on sweatshirts. You know, everybody had a crew. You either had a crew or a posse or whatever the case may be. And so I saw girls be, you know, girls being involved in it. I saw guys being involved in it, and they and they all had they 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 all had their set, so to speak. And so I saw already the marketability of what was going to happen. The question was, was that I, I, I've never, the industry never caught up to it at that time, because if the industry would have caught up to the time, it would have been a different, it would have been a different zone in any way. And even the technology, when you think about the technology that was there, the technology was pretty primitive, you know, because all we was dealing with was pretty much a turntable and, 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 and records at that, at that moment. But then when the sampler came into the game, that's when it piqued my interest because the first, you know, and, 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 and making those records had to be, I needed a sampler because I needed some way to record the records in order, and, and to put them in the context of an instrument. So, so thus, that's when I started, I, I'm, a, I'm a massive uh, uh, equipment uh, geek, so to speak. So I, and, and like Flash, I, I could build, I built sound systems. So I built my own sound system and everything else. So I pretty much understand from the, the, the sonics of, 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 of where things should need to be at. The question was, how do we put this all together and how do I put a brand and a label on top of it? And that's where Chuck came from. Because, because when, I, when I met Chuck, he, he had first did a, a, an announcement, just an announcement at a party. And I, won, I, I, I had to track him down for two years to, 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 to be, I wanted to be my MC. I said, yo, you gotta be my MC. And he was like, I'm not into that music now. <laughs> so eventually I convinced them and I'm the one that I, I, I went to Eric and I went to Keith and I went to everybody and I said yo I want to make this thing called a record and I was trying to figure out how do we build that now Chuck at the time was a guy that had a that was more like he was serious he was a and 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 and, and Flavo was kind of was kind of like spirited he was he was street he was he was everything that 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 you would that you would that was the opposite of Chuck so I so the idea came from taking the the concept of what of what me and Chuck understood in our in our black nationalist background, our Africana studies background, and kind of like bridge the gap with that in hip hop, because at that time we saw where hip hop all the hip hop artists had their own section, their own zone, and so we had to find our own zone because we wasn't you know doing what the the bragged brochures stuff that everybody else was doing. So we had to do something a little bit more cerebral, a little bit more mental. I mean, but that was like one of the most amazing parts of hip hop at the time. Not to say that there's not diversity now, but because PE didn't sound like anything else, you know, like biting wasn't allowed. Like 
LL was LL. Run DMC was Run DMC. PE was PE. Everybody, whether they had their own crew or their own group or their own production team, everybody just lived in their own space. And that's what made hip hop just so plentiful because you could kind of pick and choose what served your appetite, what wet your palate and, and became a fan that way. So, you know, I just, I love the fact that it was, it was so together, but, but separated in the sense that people were doing their own thing. Faith, when, when we talk about making records, your, your making record process was different, right? Not banging on the MP, not cutting and scratching, but understanding um, what producers and people to put together. Most people, you know, when, when you Google Faith Newman, I think the first thing that pops up is probably Nas. And you've yeah. done so many incredible things since then. Um, but I do want to talk about, you know, your start, you know, coming in as an intern, getting your first job at Def Jam and ultimately going over to um, Columbia and, and giving us one of the a yeah. recent Grammy winner. Like Nas just won a Grammy in the last Grammys. It's something that you yeah, had an intricate part of. It's, it's so amazing. Yeah, it is pretty amazing to watch his um, his his ascent. It's been it's been really exciting for me. And um, no, I actually um, you know had moved to New York by '85. I got my first internship at a company called Select Records um, with UTFO, Real Rocks, and Whistle. Uh, that was my first internship. I got a second internship at Columbia Records um, in 80, later in 86. And then by 87, I got my, an offer to work at Def Jam um, the, from Rick and Russell. So I came over there. I basically spent the, pet, the first six months of the company kind of putting together the administrative foundation of the company because there really wasn't one. Everything was kind of fast and loose, you know? Um, they didn't like have a PO system for the studio and like none of the writers had uh, or the artists had signed up with any PROs or anything like that. So I spent a good deal of time putting that stuff together um, and creating basically the A&R administration department and then going on to do more creative A&R. Um, and I, so I stayed at Def Jam till 1990, from 87 to 91, went over to Columbia in 91, um, two weeks into my, uh, tenure at Columbia was when, you know, I had been looking for Nas when I was still at Def Jam. I think everybody was, you know, and, and you know, I had I had tragedy, like take me to Queensbridge to try to see if I could meet him and all this stuff, you know, and talking to large professor about him. And ultimately, um, Search came to my office and he said, you know, this kid you're looking for, Nasty Nas, you know, I have his demo tape right here. It was a two song demo tape uh, with the um, original version of It Ain't Hard to Tell and a song called Just Another Day at the Projects. And I literally, I told Serge that he couldn't leave until we had a deal on the table. I went down to my boss, uh, who's the, David Kahn, who's the head of A&R. And I said, you know, you don't let me sign anything the entire time I'm here. I know that I knew you have to let me sign this kid. And he agreed and we went and we did the deal and then took two years to make the album. Crazy. That yeah. that process though was was different, right? With, with you having such a mix of producers on the album because like yeah. I spoke about before, people kind of had their own crew and their own sound and yes. like plucking Pete Rock from Pete Rock and Sale Smooth or plucking Tip from Tribe or plucking yep. Cream from Gangstar. What, what went that into that thought process? That, I mean, that, I gotta say, I mean, that was Nas, man. That's, that's what he wanted. He wanted the best of the best. And, and that was his, you know, that was his concept. And the rest is history. Absolutely. And still, you know, I mean, as you see it taught in schools and so revered, um, just one of the greatest, not just hip hop albums, but just one of the greatest albums. I think it's, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a work of art. And yeah, yeah absolutely. As we speak about art, Flash, the art of DJing at this point has changed, evolved, um, gone forward, gone backward so much. Talk to me about 
the DJs that you see now, um, what are your thoughts on where the culture is now musically? Um, and, and just, you know, with the advent of technology, obviously certain things become easier, but then yeah. you're not as skilled as you once were. Well, for me, um, I think from where I come from and from where I'm sitting, the DJ and the rapper, whether it was a crew or not, they were always one unit. That is now no longer the case. So you don't, like, you know, today's artists, you know, the rappers, um, a, a good majority of them do not use the DJ, you know. Um, but here's where I think if a person is going to go see a show of an artist, like when you record the record, that's perfection, right? You go in, whether the, uh, the artist has to punch the vocal, or whatever, to get it right. And whether the producer has to mix the record to get it right sonically. But I think the pinnacle of a performance is to see an artist without the assistance of the perfection. But I think what separates the men from the boys when it comes to this hip hop thing is, or whether it's pop or rock or whatever, is to see your favorite artist do it impromptu without the assistance of the technology. And the example I'm gonna use is Jay-Z. When he first went to the garden, it's like he would do a song, and then he say, oh, F it. I'm going to just spit acapella. Or his DJ would throw something in that had nothing to do with the album. Like, I think a performance should be unperfect. And that's how you see the human in the human. And with the DJ being missing, it becomes perfect. But hip hop is not perfect. And I'll use Hank Shockley as an example. He was a genius at connecting two seconds of a James Brown sample, then a baby Huey, and then a whatever, whatever. And all these things were sonically imperfect. Once he strung it all together in the sampler, but that's what made it magic and that's what made it dope. It's because that two seconds of that James Brown sample connected to uh, uh, Thin Lizzy or whatever, or Queen or whatever. All those songs have different sonics. But when you're listening to that with Chuck over the top of that, that's hip hop. Unperfect. Absolutely. And that's, Absolutely. And that's pretty much, and, that's, and that is the basis of hip hop in its inception. The unperfect putting together and making it some kind of unperfect perfect. For sure. And that's sure. why, and that's why when I was human sampling and then a genius of Hank Shockley to take the samples and put it together and put a, a vocal on top of it, it's a reason why it blew up. Right. It's a combination right. of a great vocalist and incredible artist of these samples and the intertwining of these things. It's what made it incredible. It For had sure. to work. Had to work. You know, jumping piggybacking off of intertwining, Hank, recently we saw um, like a newer version, an updated version of, of Fight the Power, right? With, with some new artists on it. Um, how do you feel about where hip hop is right now? You know, because one thing that I wanted to do in this conversation was figure out a way to bridge the gap. I feel like in our community and culture is where you get so much division, you know, the new school don't respect the old school. You an old head, I can't learn from you. All the new kids don't respect it. But when you get Chuck D and Nas and Rhapsody on one record, right? That's multiple generations that bridges the gap in so many different ways. Talk to me about your thoughts on where hip hop is now um, from a business perspective and also from a creative. Well, you know, from the creative perspective, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that hip hop is a reflection of what's going on to me, all right? It's what's happening at this very moment. When you look at what's happening, a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of like, you know, negative vibrations that went from the older generation to the younger generation because they don't understand the dynamics that the younger generation has to deal with. 
The dynamics of the younger generation today is all about, you know, they have to become with commercial, everything. They, 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 on, they on what I consider to be the 24 second shot clock. Right? It's like they don't have time. You know, we, we had the luxury of, of, of you can go home, listen to the record. There was not much distractions, not much going on. Today, they got iPhones. They got, you know, they got, you know, pad, iPads. They got, they got streaming. They got all kinds of stuff that's vying for your time. Video games, all kinds of stuff. So they have to be able to give you the song in, in five seconds. If, they, if that song doesn't catch you in five seconds, then it's whack. And so that's the that's the that dynamic the dynamic that I think is intriguing because now what it does it brings me back to the era of the '50s when songs were commercials and and they had to they had to have a jingle a catchy phrase from the beginning and a catchy phrase in the middle and a catchy phrase at the end. Well, that's the same thing that's happening with hip hop right now. That's why I'm loving it I'm, I, I, because they only have they don't have much much time to get their point across. So they gotta be quick and dynamic. The same thing with sampling. The same, we, we didn't have a much time to get our point across. So I need to, I need to get a lot of samples in a, in a short period of time because I didn't wanna lose the attention span of people. Um, Rocky, this Universal Hip Hop Museum, when are we looking to break ground? Um, and, and what steps do we need to take? What can we do after we finish this conversation to help push that along because as much as we love what's come from the past, we want to revere it. We also want to give the newer generation to understand why if you're inspired by 2 Chains, he signed to Faith because she signed Nas, who was on Def Jam with Public Enemy, who was inspired by Grandmaster Flash. These dots get connected. What can we do to help bring the, the, the museum to fruition? Well, well, the purpose of the museum is to make sure that all the dots have an understanding so that, that, that's one of our mission is to promote understanding of the culture. Because most young kids only think that hip hop is rap because that's what they relate to on the radio. But they, you know, our job as a museum is to make sure that they understand that this is a, a living, breathing culture that continues to evolve and adapt on a global level. For sure. And, and part of my mission today was to make sure that this conversation, listen, we could do this for five more hours. Not that you guys have the time, but this conversation I felt was, was very much needed, um, not only for the New York chapter, just for anybody who loves hip hop, who loves the culture. Um, so on behalf of the New York chapter of Recording Academy, myself, Vice President, Grandmaster Flash, we thank you, we honor you, we love you, legend. Same to you, Hank Shockley. Rocky, thank you so much for your contributions. Faith, you know how much I love and appreciate you. Um, I thank you all for being here. I thank you all for what you've done to put me in the position that I am today because all of you, played a part in my evolution and, and the way that I was able to develop as a talent. And so thank you all for being here. Thank you for being a part of the conversation. Speak to you all soon. Rocky, I'm at that museum. I'm trying to see you out there, baby. Come, you know, we, we have a revolution in hip hop exhibit that's opened up now. So come on through. Amazing, amazing. Thank you all for being here for your time. Thank you. Peace thank you, Teray. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, Hank. All right, man. My first hip hop memory is i'm a guy that love adidas i always feel like my adidas in the beginning don't play with that i remember how in the beginning when in the beginning i started learning about hip-hop it wasn't in the mainstream i remember there was a, a um, music box was a net network like you know we have bt we have mtv they had mtv but music box was a way to listen to uh, music in our communities, which is hip hop, right? And one day, I just heard, I just heard this one, this one, this one song with uh, "Walk This Way" with Aerosmith and with Run DMC. I was like, we made it. I was like, it's on now. Now I could wear my Adidas, and now we are going mainstream because, because it, it was, it, it, it wasn't black. Black music wasn't really, hip hop wasn't making it uh, at MTV, you know what I'm saying, at the time. And and of course, you know, you had the Michael Jackson, you could have all those, but hip hop wasn't. And that's when I know for me, it was uh, one of my best hip hop memories and say, oh my God, we going somewhere. And big shout out to that, to Music Box that did the stuff, but big shout out to that, um, to MTV that actually 
you know, that song made it there. So that's my memory, one of them. Yeah.